foster uh, the kind of business that we want to have. So that, and I, and I understand that you know, wineries don't pay meals and lodging, but our meals and lodging and our sales tax revenue have gone way up. They and could if you just charge them <laughs> sell food. That's true, <laughs> which we're not allowed to do. Um, but um, the more we can take advantage of these other sources of uh, revenue, the lighter the load we can maybe look at, uh, you know, costing the taxpayer on the real estate. But it's got to work for our county. So those are those would be my three. Okay, Mr. Whitson. Well, I use I use um, Ms. Smith's agenda items to do some um, <laughs> careful self-reflection. So I went back to my 2019 campaign materials to see if I'm doing what I said I would do, because that that actually dovetails, I think, with our collective goal um, on our board. Um, so limit property tax increases, and I've spoken to that a couple of times already, maybe we need to reduce property taxes. Control spending, I think our cash position is great, and I think we should strive to keep it that way. Um, Again, if I remember the cash flow graph, we're five million above where we were six years ago at this time of the fiscal year. Um, obviously, it's a high cash time right after property tax collections, but still, I think that we all should be proud of our very cautious spending, and we um, should be grateful, to Mr. Curry, for his, his guidance on budgeting, especially during the pandemic and come out the back end of the pandemic. Hopefully, it's the back end. In the cash position we find ourselves is really encouraging, so I just don't want to be asleep at the wheel. Let's let's hold on to our cash and, and stay strong and away from debt. Um, manage and plan for infrastructure repair and upgrades. We did a little bit of our funding of uh, uh, to help with the uh, sparingal uh, wastewater treatment system, and so when I talk about infrastructure repair and upgrades, I would mean I mean that system, uh, the town of Washington systems, to the extent we can assist there. Um, and then obviously, courthouse road buildings, and uh, I'm grateful my colleagues, Mr. Frazier, Ms. Smith, and other uh, community volunteers for their work on, on planning for all, all of those improvements. So I think that's another priority, infrastructure generally, buildings in particular along with wastewater treatment and in Sperryville also. Um, help small business owners, and I think that the pandemic really obviously stressed a lot of people with small, small business owners. And that comes down to balancing um, every decision we make in the context of a comprehensive plan and whether something fits or doesn't fit, as Mr. Harding just said. So I want to help small business owners. I don't want to be adverse to them, but we also have an obligation to the broader community to protect our landscape and our open space. So just keeping an eye on the ball um, in that regard. Um, so continue to support and work closely with the school superintendent and the school board. And I'm looking forward to it tomorrow night. I think we've had a very good relationship with them. So we've asked uh, hard questions in the context of declining enrollment, I think we're going to have to continue to have um, very frank discussions with the school board and the superintendent about how to balance school funding um, with the reality that uh, enrollment is declining and that fixed overhead costs uh, are not declining. I think that's a, another priority and that's just a matter of continuing to strengthen our relationship with our counterparts on the school board and with the superintendent. And then continue to advocate and help our fire and rescue companies. And we've talked about some of that tonight. And um, and I think we all recognize that going to advanced life support paid folks, um, on one hand, is really a great public safety move for our citizens. And I think we've done it so far quite inexpensively um, with great value um, for our citizens and a backstop from a public safety standpoint. But also recognizing the inherent attention that introduces into our volunteer fire and rescue companies. And it was managing that with um, the professionals who work with us on county staff and being sensitive to volunteer development, the needs of our volunteers while also protecting our citizens. So, um, so those are, I guess, my seven uh, priorities, all looking all the way back to 2019 and what I had set out to do as a candidate. So thank you.
Thank you. Um, everybody's got a great list. Fire and rescue, um, recruitment, retention, appreciation, and making sure the citizens um, are heard with their needs um, as well as the volunteers needs I think are very important and uh, we're headed in the right direction I think in the conversations we're having. Um, fiber, CenturyLink connectivity, um, I said it to many people that I can't believe in today's age that we've still got people that can't pick up a phone and dial 911 every now and then and I think that has to be a, a priority that we are all focused on. Um, something I said to Mr. Curry last year, and I, I believe it even more this year, uh, I do believe it's um, probably time for Rappahannock County to have a strategic plan mission vision of the county, um, where we're not just looking year to year, but we have at least a three or a three to five year plan, um, because we are hitting the um, zoning questions and the, you know, who do we want to be um, in the next few years, the zoning is going to have to be put in place to make sure that we can get to where we want to be, but but protect us as well. Um, it's obvious to everyone that we're being surrounded by growth. And uh, knocking on the door is one thing, but pushing the door down to come through is what I'm hoping we can avoid. Um, schools, uh, budget, you know, making sure that we're uh, being fiscally responsible with the monies that they, they, they're they receiving. Um, I do believe they have opportunities for more seats in, uh, or what's it called, butts in the seat, something like that. Um, so I think uh, hopefully we can um, support them in um, their initiatives to try to, to counteract the LCI, because we know we're not going to get money um, in the LCI world. And... The buildings, that's a must-do. It's not a like a nice to have, it's a must-have. Uh, so trying to make sure that we do that in a way that's responsible and um, the citizens know um, communication-wise. You guys in the building committee have started that from the, um, the last meeting we had, making sure everybody knows the conversation that we're having and how serious it is. And um, hopefully we'll figure that out um, pretty in the near future, what the true goal and timeline and expense will be. Um, I think that's all I had. I think our lists are pretty darn close. Some a little bit more than others, but uh, in general, I think that's a good conversation to have. Thank you for adding it to the agenda. Well, I, I think it, it sort of parallels with your uh, you know, strategic plan idea. You know, unless you know where you're headed, it's hard to get there. Um, so I just think that this is a, a conversation we could, should continue. I know some boards do retreats and that sort of thing. I, I don't know that that's really a good fit for us. But, um, you know, I think a... a a conversation from time to time about what we really should be concentrating on is, is a very beneficial thing um, in a county as small and with as little staff as we have. Thank you. I think Yogi Bear said it when he said, uh, if you don't know where you're going, you'll probably wind up someplace else. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And it's, it's better for us to plan our future somewhat than to have it planned for us by other people. If, if we don't have any plans for ourselves, it will be, and 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 you know that's that's just the way life is. The timeline that um, at the Chairman's Institute, um, they had done a timeline on um, strategic plans, missions, visions, um, and as you can imagine, it was after the budget is done. Um, so if we want to get it on the budget or the uh, agenda at some point, I would recommend after May, probably. Maybe it would be interesting if there were some models that we could read in advance of discussion. Any recommendations from VACO, like maybe for mm -hmm. comparable rural counties, that would be, um, I think, maybe beneficial reading material. Yeah, good idea. Do you know that Warren County, I believe, went through it last year, I think. So theirs is supposed to be online. Um, I haven't looked at it, but um, give us an idea. And uh, happy to reach out to Vega for models. Orange County's is, is pretty good, too, if I remember right. 
All right. Um, moving into um, Addendum 220204, Century Link Landline. This came out of the discussions um, that we had in Richmond. Um, at first, we thought we had missed the deadline for actually being able to speak during the SCC hearing that's on February 23rd. Um, Albert Morrill came back and said we have until February 16th to submit um, a speaking uh, request. We've got the citizens can send in and please ask folks in your district um, that have had issues with CenturyLink if they have a ticket number and kind of the, you know, the ex process that they went through. Um, in my case, I put in a ticket number and um, the next day expecting somebody to come out and they didn't and I followed back up with CenturyLink and they said, oh, that case has been resolved so we canceled it. Nobody had talked to me, nobody had asked, any, you know, anything. So you resubmit the ticket, you get another ticket number. I've been doing it by chat, so I have the, the thread, um, which I would highly recommend to any of our citizens that have CenturyLink issues. But if you have that kind of data, you can submit through the SCC link that Mr. Curry, I think it's right here, um, put in the board doc item. You can go and give um, the SEC your information as to any troubles you've had with Centrally, but they really are looking for specifics, not just the, you know, two years ago when I picked up my phone, it wasn't there or whatever. They need ticket numbers and expectations. Um, the ability to speak is, and I have not gone to find out how much time, it's probably five minutes or less would be my guess. Um, and you just have to register your name with the SEC so that they know that you're going to actually say something. Um, my goal, if the board um, supports this, is to um, not just give them numbers of citizens and, um, you know, numbers of people that we know have been out, but to really try to emphasize the emotional public safety side of things. Um, if you're in your home and you need to be able to call 911 and you go pick up the phone and there's no dial tone, in suburbia, that may not be an issue because you pick up your cell phone and you can do it. In Rappahannock County, that's not possible in all situations. Um, so I want to make sure that we're not just talking statistics and numbers and get really into the public safety, the citizen that lives in our county, what they're having to deal with. And we are, there's now like six counties that are, um, I think, in one way or another participating in this because it's it's bad. Albemarle County, I don't know if you saw the article, was talking about citizens using bullhorns to communicate with each other if they needed help. Um, that made the news, as you can imagine. So um, although we have it bad, it sounds like it's bad everywhere, in the, especially in rural Virginia. I was in North Carolina on the Outer Banks, and everyone was saying how terrible their phone service was, and I drove by, and sure enough, it was a century like building. Oh, no matter where you go, something's never changed. So it's, it's not just Virginia, not that that does, makes it any better. North Carolina has issues too with those. I would just like to bring it back up maybe to 50,000 square feet and say that um, the current SEC case that's referenced here is regarding the imminent uh, transaction to sell the CenturyLink slash Lumen um, landline business in this area in the entire state to Apollo doing business as Brightspeed. And so that is the avenue through which citizens and the board and other localities can provide comment on the SCC's review of that um, sale or whatever it is. Um, there is a very, very good document attached to four docs that is the pre-filed testimony from SEC representative who we work with uh, that very painstakingly goes through and describes the problems that our citizens and others in the community and the state are having with CenturyLink. And uh, so um, it's unlikely that we would be able to stop the sale, nor would we necessarily want to stop the sale. The idea is that when the sale goes through, that certain things are attached and um, certain requirements are applied to the new company, Brightspeed, uh, with respect to their ability to maintain the copper infrastructure, particularly in those areas where there are no other resources. And uh, so um, Ms. King has some very good language about uh, putting in place escalating process through um, 
that the new company would have to go through if they failed to meet certain metrics for restoration. Uh, that's the sort of angle that I think is very important for us. Uh, to The copper's here. We know we're going to have to rely on the copper for a while. The, the companies are responsible as a universal carrier to provide right, universal carrier. Uh, provide the uh, communication. Uh, so that's what it's all about. Now, we talked earlier about uh, with Mr. Nesbitt about VDOT and the getting with CenturyLink, completely non-responsive. I've pushed from our side. We had a telephone call with all of the Virginia people for CenturyLink. They told us they will send us certain things. They told us who to contact for the VDOT coordination. And after that call, communication went completely silent, haven't heard a word, likely because they know they're gearing up to spin off. And so, and VDOT can't get anybody to respond to them. I can't get anybody to respond to me. Uh, so the SCC is our path. Well, uh, uh, as I mentioned to Mr. Curry last week, I think it was on the first or second, but anyway, a young lady's a corporate attorney. She's not working in that field right now, but she was working in telecommunications and, and even broadband communication, and she reached out to me, and, and, and I think I mispronounced it as universal coverage. She said, we need to go through the FCC to find out who's getting that money and see if we can apply some kind of leverage there. So, uh, I mean, I can ask her if she can give me a hand on that since she volunteered to, uh, to do something. In the group that Ms. Donahue gathered together, I think came to that similar conclusion that if you can't get what you want through the SCC, then the FCC is next. Uh, and so uh, any information that you can provide that would be helpful. Well, I hate to call the feds then, but I mean, if they've got a bigger set of boots, maybe we need them. Yeah. And I know Albemarle County is, you know, looking at the FCC already as well, and they've been really great about sharing information um, as to what they've done to date. Um, but I think the bottom line is we've got two to four to five years um, before we have another form of communication. So what happens with the landlines in between that time, if they spin off. Um, That's exactly what I was saying in my notes to the board a month ago is, you know, I don't think waiting is really the way to go. I think we need to restructure our agreement with all points to some degree to where we can work with um, wireless communications, because we don't have that. And our and our, our neighbors did that, They they went they upgraded their wireless communications before they got locked into this contract. We don't have that, and now we're seeing the detriment of that, that we could wind up with nothing. The, the, the Virginia Administrative Code includes the, um, the corrective action periods for these ILICs, and so uh, they're, they must repair a certain percentage of the outages within a certain period of time, and um, and the SCC is supposed to make sure that happens. So as the infrastructure continues to um, decay, uh, it was the battle of investment or not, and, but they still are required to do it, and we need to keep pounding away at the State Corporation Commission. Well, you can't them force to somebody to stay in business, but if they're getting money, if somebody's getting that money, then it needs to be applied properly. Right. So for this agenda item, all I was looking for was the authority to submit my name as speaking on February 23rd. I think this is the proper way to do this, so I'll put that in the form of a motion. A motion, do I have a second? I second that. All second. <laughs> Sorry, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? I just want to make sure this is strictly a, a layout of issues. It's not a negotiation or any kind of start of anything like that. This and, is just fact gathering. And this is about copper landline oh voice communications. I don't think you run afoul of any agreements that any other group might have. Okay. And then to. I would just say I, I would encourage uh, also maybe um, a printout or comparison and contrast of the law we compiled. Um, for uh, landline issues after the recommendation of the Public Safety Committee and the stark contrast and responsiveness um, from other providers 
versus CenturyLink and the chronic, profound, ongoing um, issues that we uncovered um, when we instituted that program. And, and to the point that a lot of people are so discouraged they won't even lodge a complaint. Exactly. And that's what I've said at the, the table. I don't know how many of our citizens at this point care enough to try to get online to try to submit this information. But if you have any, I'm going to share um, some information with Mr. Curry um, with regards to the 911 outage or dispatch outage um, and Mrs. Welsh's. Um, I got tons of screenshots on what she went through for Mr. Welsh and um, us personally in the Wakefield area when the, the uh, box got mowed over. So I'll be sharing all that with him that will get submitted at the 17th? 16th. 16th. Um, so if you have it, anything factual, detailed that we can get to the office, <coughs> all of these counters are going to be doing it, which will be great because that means the SEC will be getting bukus of submissions. Wouldn't hurt to mention how much we pay every month, too, in telephone service yeah. as a county. All right, so I'm going to um, call for the vote if you're ready. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, thank you very much. Hmm. Have, oh. This is where you inserted the item regarding strategic planning for fire and rescue. Yes. I think that we had discussed uh, perhaps the board holding a, a meeting at the next available um, Fire and Rescue Associated meeting, uh, provided that there's enough time for notice. So the, I believe the next is this Friday, so, um, so, so. I think technically you could, but we don't know if they whether each us. company is going to be represented. They, they, the attendance might be different and companies might schedule themselves differently if they knew the board planned to be there. Well, where is it at anyway? Because I think we just had it at Little Washington. We need a large, large venue for that. I, I don't know. Amosville, maybe? Well, it needs to be at Amosville or Little Washington. Uh, uh, Mr. Jackson said he thought it was going to be a Spiritville Rescue, which is not nearly large enough. I just, I'm concerned too that if we, if we schedule this tonight without talking. No, we, we're going to have to talk with them. the association first. It would be my preference yeah. to have a discussion with the association and schedule accordingly. And then we can always have a special meeting. I, I can meet, I think I have pretty good uh, rapport with some of those members. I, I wouldn't mind doing it, but. Um, okay. you, I think we're going to have to have it soon, and we're, we're going to have to have it at a large enough hall, and there's only two of them really that's large enough. Yeah. I'll put forward a motion that Mr. Perry make contact with uh, <laughs> leadership within the Fire and Rescue Association to schedule a joint meeting on the a, on a date to be determined. Date, time, and place to be determined. I'll get that set up as quick as can so we can uh, get those dates, time, and places advertised. Okay. You're going to reach out to Mr. Nick, I assume? Here's second. I'll second that motion. We okay. have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Do I get a raise for this? And a credit card. I think we're up to triple now. Don't triple. And a credit you, you card. Just be a board member. Don't be and a credit card. Oh, that's a good point. <laughs> All right. I've always wanted my own army truck. I'll make a motion. I'll be adjourned. Do I have a second? A second. Ms. Smith, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitson. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for Thank you, Mr. Whitson. Thank you. Working hopefully in conjunction with them. And uh, the zoning ordinance, we just talked about that. We've got the, the definitions that we've got to work on to try and, and, and have some sort of a harmonious atmosphere in the county with these uh, small commercial enterprises. We've got a lot of stuff on our plate, and I think that this is just serving as a distraction right now. I think once they know what our position is, I think let them move forward. Well, and we're also approaching budget season. 
I mean, for us, I know Jeez, you had to the bring county's been working at the administrator's been working on the budget for quite some time. That's all, Mr. But, but we are, we are just really, one more thing on his plate. I mean, budget season is, is extra meetings and, and more work already, and really should be our focus for its duration. Um, this letter says that we're waiting for additional documentation from the landowner and their attorney, and I suggest we wait for additional information from the landowner and their attorney. Yeah. All right. Any other yeah, and I would, um, I would um, this is Kier Woodson, um, I would encourage everyone to go back to the, I think it was January 4th, 2021, meeting, uh, our afternoon meeting on that date, about one hour and 55 minutes into the video, just so you can hear where the whole idea of, of sort of a, an exchange of something um, it, as part of boundary line agreement originated. Um, and then there's also the draft agreement that was sent to us in August, as I mentioned. So I would just recommend to all my colleagues, including Mr. Carney, who's joined recently, that you take a look at all of that. Um, because I think it's important context, and it happened so long ago, and even some members of the town government have forgotten about it. Um, so, I mean, it's important. Because that's kind of how this all started. <laughs> okay. And it was, um, I, yeah, I think it was August, I'm sorry, July 30th, 2021. We saw the date of the draft agreement. Thank you for that. Yeah. All right, I'm going to keep this going. Um, we don't have a P4, right? Q1 amended credit card policy. I thought we added something. Uh, we added a Q5. Okay. Um, yes, the uh, board adopted a credit card policy, I believe, uh, shortly before I came on board here. Uh, recently, during the discussion, my recommended changes of the purchasing um, ordinance, I noted during those discussions that uh, what got me into digging into that purchasing ordinance was a review of the credit card policy. Um, and uh, there's an order of operations. I've uh, since reviewed the credit card policy with Ms. Nick. Um, we have uh, both uh, recommended several changes. Uh, they are provided here in this attached uh, document. As you guess, April 3rd, 2017 was when this was last adopted. And so I would ask the board's consideration to amend your current policy, which was adopted by motion. Uh, to include these represented changes uh, that largely provide me with more structure for reviewing uh, and ensuring proper administrative protocols to make sure that credit cards continue to be used appropriately. This looks great, and I, and I noticed on the credit card statements this month, one of the things is already happened, which, we, which was uh, points being redeemed for monetary value against the uh, the credit card invoice total. We would much rather those points be redeemed for cash that goes into the fund balance rather than offsetting some expense. Oh. Um, either, you know, technically is appropriate, but it conflates when the point was was earned and then it's applied to one department versus de another department. Some, some of these cards are used to make purchases across several departments, for example, mine. Right. So the points are from several departments, but might be redeemed for just one department. It just is a bit of a mess. Uh, we budget for appropriate expenditures, and so there's no reason why those expenditures can't hit the proper general ledger line. And if there are reward points available, they should be remitted in cash and submitted it to the treasury and available for any use the board of supervisors deems appropriate in the future. Interesting. Hmm. Now, I only have one problem so far with it is the uh, 5B, the county administrator has the sole authority to set together with the bank an appropriate single purchase limit and credit limit. I think that was the previous. Um, That's in red. Where is this? Five. 
Let's start with letters. What, deep, what letter five, section are you in? It's, it's 5B. Oh, five, five, general. Okay. Page 2. Um, it, it sets up a situation where somebody hits me on the street with something and I have no idea what they're talking about because you or your successor does it. I believe actually that was moved. Um, perhaps. Let's see. Maybe I'm reading the wrong one. No, you're, you're reading it right. But I think that was already in there, maybe just in a different location. So two, it speaks to decision when is made, is made by me. I guess I'm thinking back to that section. Is that subject to an overall cap that's already been implemented or? Well, the bank is gonna limit us in general. You know, with the county holding a the card, they're not going to have much of a limit. Uh, well, you'd be surprised, actually. I, we had to go to battle with them to get my limit increased so that we were positioned for an event of emergency. I just don't want to buy any more army trucks with a credit card. <laughs> well, that is, um, let's skip. that's covered by a different section. Um, that uh, this E section, I think. Where was that? The Rules Committee looked at this, didn't you? No, um, I don't remember <clears throat> looking at this exactly. Oh, I think what well, this is subject to the um, one of the main changes was that in the top is to provide a convenient method for small purchases. Per Rappahannock County Code Section 435A, so it is the direct tie in to the purchasing ordinance, which wasn't there before, which the purchasing ordinance would allow that purchase only to happen if it's already budgeted, right, and, and appropriated. I think right. that's, that's the tie in. I'm happy to change this section in 5B if you wanted to say something else. Um, I've looked at our, our current, what we have currently is, I think, suitable for our credit limits. Um, as long as you're not intending to increase them dramatically, I don't have a problem. No, and if somebody were to be issued a card, then they, it would have to be set a limit. But most people don't want anything to do with them, given the history. That's why we only have four. Anyone want to make a motion? I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve board policy 301 credit card policy as proposed. With the 5B intact? Um, well, do you have a suggestion how you'd like that to read? I just think the county board has the sole authority to set together with bank an appropriate single purchase limit and credit limit. Right. Is this not tied to 43-5A? Yeah, I would say that it would be, it would not be administra very administratively implementing, implementable to have every one of those decisions go to the board. However, I would say that if the board is to adopt this policy by motion, at any meeting you can adopt a motion to do anything you want, including setting the limit of a credit card despite what this says. But it might be problematic to do, like I suggested previously, but I think we need to do something besides this language. If, if we can do something quickly, then I can support this. If not, then I can't. We have a motion. Let me get a second before we do any further discussion, if there is a second. 
I'll second Mr. Carney's motion. Okay. Now we go into discussion. Any further? Um, the board, of, is, board of Supervisors grants the county administrator the authority to set blah, 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 blah. That doesn't, that grants the authority, doesn't say sole authority, and the board could hold to your own the authority to well, that, take any action you want anytime you want. I, I can swallow that one a lot easier. It seems like we're uh, abdicating our position by saying that the well, county administrator has the sole authority. The intent was that no other users have the authority to set their own limit. Uh, okay, yeah, it's just, I, I can see where just a word or two made a big difference. So you're changing it to the county administrator? The board of supervisor. As, as board authority authorizes. The county administrator. How do we say that's Delete palatable? as the sole authority. Okay. The board of supervisors authorizes the county administrator to set together with the bank an appropriate single purchase limit and credit limit. I'm, I'm sorry, I have this little quirk that I think that the elected governing body actually is supposed to mean something so <laughs> all right so mr carney you made the motion do you want to um amend your motion sure i guess we'd have to withdraw it and then sure, start do I have to motion again? no uh, okay. so i'll amend it to then the board of supervisors what is that i can't read your handwriting the, bo <laughs> <laughs> the board is rather than the last sentence of five, of five b would then would read the board of supervisors authorizes the county administrator to set together with a bank an appropriate single purchase limit and credit limit. I shall amend it to that. Okay. Mr. Whitson, do you want to second? Yeah, that? I will. Um, yeah, I'll refresh my second to track with the amended motion. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Thank you. I get a credit card. Mr. Curry, is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Curry, is that um, because it's policy and not, um, not an ordinance? It doesn't require a roll call vote. Am I correct? That's correct. Just a motion. Uh, you okay. could right. you could adopt a resolution to approve the policy, which would require a roll call. Okay. All right. Thanks. We can send that to the rules committee for further review. <laughs> Bring it back next week. <clears throat> <Good. Good. laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks everyone on that one. Um, General Assembly update. Um, I think Ms. Smith originally asked to have a few items discussed. One was SB 255, which was the bill regarding um, your local ability to um, consider the zoning of towers that uh, first was less than uh, 200 feet, then shrunk to 100 feet, uh, and has now been carried over to next year and not a concern this year. So that is very good. A lot of people across the state were very worried about the state basically telling us you would have to permit any tower up to 150 feet if there wasn't another tower within four miles. Um, that's certainly not how we do business here. Uh, there are several other bills. Uh, many are, as you're aware, um, bills are filtering out every day. Um, I've attached the documents from VACO and VML from their uh, local government day, which both have very good descriptions of um, this bills that are currently still of concern or were a couple days ago, as well as budget amendments, which there are several that are uh, very uh, critical. Um, some of the more critical budget amendments have to do with the um, funding for jails and the per diems, and that could, if those go through, the state responsible inmates, which our local jails have been having to house, and the state just doesn't take them, and we have to pay, and we get very little money for that, those, those fees will start to ratchet up, um, perhaps very quickly uh, in some of the bills. We'll see how that works out. Uh, the big bills that people talk about, um, the referendum requirement for um, the situation the county is in this year, uh, which is a reassessment year. 
and requiring a referendum if you increase the tax rate above the equalized rate. That's still kind of floating around with some uh, substitute language. We'll have to keep monitoring that. It's not as big of a deal for us because we only do this once every six years and don't raise taxes very often. Some localities do assessments every year or every other year and uh, have, to have to do a referendum if they need to raise taxes for some reason uh, really throws a monkey wrench into the process and calls to question, in my mind, um, the point of representative government. But uh, we'll have to pay very close attention to that, uh, notwithstanding the fact that it might not affect us. The problem is, first it starts with a reassessment year, then it's any time you raise taxes, then it's any time you raise personal property taxes, and before you know it, it's a referendum for everything which really grinds to a halt any progress that you the board may want to shift the tax burden from um, vehicles to residential or the other way around, and you're really stymied to do those things if it takes six months to go through a process. And uh, over in West Virginia, the school board has taxing authority, but uh, they have to have a referendum to raise the taxes for the school, whereas the county commissioners and just set your tax rate higher for general fund purposes. I will and say, in Hardy County, West Virginia, I think three or four years in a row, they voters voted down a tax increase for the school budget, and they just simply spent in the red because there didn't seem to be any restrictions against that. Yeah. They, well, we're not allowed to do In that. three or four years, they ran up like a million-dollar deficit. Well, we can spend in the red here. Um, you have a fund balance. You can eat away at that. It's just a short rope, and eventually you get to the end of it. Uh, they, they didn't have any money. They just kept, I guess, borrowing. Now, specifically to that bill, if it does go through, and if it did apply to this year, which neither of those things is going to happen because it wouldn't apply until July, um, I'm quite confident I will not be recommending an increase in the real estate tax rate above the equalized rate. So this would trigger wouldn't happen anyway for us. Um, but notwithstanding that, that's there. If there are any particular bills that you've heard about, I might be able to provide an update, um, or we can track into these documents and look them up. Did yeah. you look at the one, uh, any comments specific about the uh, law enforcement one for the sheriff's deputies? Does that really mean anything for us out here? The, there are a couple that you might have heard about is HB 599 funding, which is for police. And there have been some comments from um, the governor about localities that have reduced their budget over time. We actually hit the newspaper and I think Fredericksburg because Rappahannock was listed as reducing the funds for law enforcement. Even though we don't have a police department and that doesn't apply to us, and the reason it looked like that is because between 19 and 20, or 2021, 20, I can't remember whichever years, is when the board created a separate uh, capital fund. And so these items that used to be capitalized that were budgeted into that operating department, like the, I think it was a records management system and this or that, they weren't there anymore. So it looked like the operating budget went down. It was just the fact. So that doesn't affect you anyway. Different pools of money. Yeah. And, and that's precisely why you have a capital fund, because capital is prone to f go up and down over time as you need to uh, make major purchases, and it really changes the optics of what's happening with those recurring expenses. Uh, it kind of makes it look like the spending went down, when actually, if you look at the line by line, the spending went up. Um, the big uh, compensation items for um, state responsible employees, whether they be social services, um, or compensation board, whether it's one of your constitutional officers or their staff, those are still looking to be 5% over the next two years. That's a big hit for us to try to do that, but if you don't do that, you're not going to get the state portion of the revenue, which at least for the comp board uh, positions is a decent amount of money for those employees. So we know we have plenty of employees who aren't comp board funded. Now, when you get to the schools, it's not all the positions, and it filters through the LCI, so you, know, you get 20% of some okay. of the employees, right. and it really, it's, you know, thank you very much, state. Yeah. Um, because you know your neighbors who have a much lower LCI, they're going to go take that money and do it. Uh, so that, that is a big uh, item that we continue to follow. 
us. Uh, I haven't seen any critical zoning bills that really give me much concern. Um, I'm sure they're uh, now that the the cell tower one is is out. Um, another one just flashed it in my brain. Um, there is HB 1164, which is still alive right now. I don't expect it to be alive and get approved. That would um, allow, would have the land use value used in the LCI calculation. There's usually one of those every year. Um, I did provide written comments based on, for that, that uh, there's a hearing tomorrow morning. I'll probably listen in, might provide oral comment, knowing that there's long held position of the board that we would love land use mm. value to be used in the LCI formula because our LCI would drop to like 0.6 something, so if I post to 0.8. Um, so that's uh, happening. Um, several bad bills that have failed, including uh, disallowing us to collect all kinds of fees at the jail, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. We're thankful that those failed. Anything else? There's thousands of bills. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is scary. How can you possibly pay attention to all of them? Yeah. But these two documents are very valuable. You have spare time, read through them. All right, um, moving on to board priorities, goals for 2022. Ms. Smith, I think. Yeah, I had asked Mr. Curry to add this to the agenda because, well, largely because of the list we ran down not too long ago. Um, we have a lot of things that we're working on. Uh, I don't necessarily think we need to reach consensus on it tonight, but we have a lot of things that we're working on and we have limited staff. Um, what can we reasonably expect to accomplish? And how should we spend our time and energy to accomplish those things? And what are our expectations? How do we get there from here? Um, I just think it's important that we all hear from each other, uh, gather your thoughts, and you know, a short list of three to five things that are your, your most critical uh, priorities. And, and to me, if, if we have those things in common, and I think we mostly do. Um, that's where, where we should really concentrate our energies. And there, we know there will be a lot of other distractions that will come along the way. And those things must be dealt with, too. But we have to have a long-term plan if we're going to get any work done. Mm -hmm. you want to start? Well, um, I had gathered my thoughts a little bit. I know we had this discussion a little bit last year, but I still... Um, have a lot of concerns with communication options to the 231 corridor and I know that's been challenging um, to get any headway there's been a lot of changes in Madison um, there's a uh, topographical changes challenges of uh, telecommunications companies not really being so interested through that corridor um, but that is a continuing challenge for my district um, obviously to uh, the district I represent um, the issues with traffic and tourism and the challenges that, um, that are presented by, um, by that sort of economy. It's, it's great opportunities, but it comes with its own unique set of challenges and, and we need to um, work through those, whether they come through traffic issues, like we discussed last year, and speeding and those sorts of things, or um, parking at trailheads, like we discussed earlier today which um, might seem like a small thing that would be easy to get a hold on, but as we've all been through it before, it is not. Um, and that, I think, will be a, real, will be a major challenge this year. Um, continuing to support our uh, volunteer fire and rescue efforts and realizing that that is an excellent service and value that um, our volunteers provide for us and to figure out every way we can to um, help them to succeed um, continues obviously to be a, a, a main point for me. Um, concentrating on meeting our goals for planning and zoning and getting some of that language over the goal line um, and realizing that maybe in the middle of a pandemic that's not your number one priority but um, 
let's, we really do need to get through that, um, especially now that we've enlisted the help of the Berkeley group. Um, some of the things that made the list last year, pandemic management and keeping children in school, I, I think we can kind of set those aside for me this year, hopefully. Things seem to be going well. Um, we have to get through um, the allocation of the rest of the ARPA funding, and um, that will always be an interesting um, exercise to see how everyone feels that money should be spent. And there seems to be a lot of latitude with that funding so let's realize some great opportunities there. Um, that's that's a list. I don't know that that's the final list, but past three to five. Though. But um, but I think those are major items that that we should keep in our sights and and hit regularly. Um, avoiding and, and hand in glove with ARPA, as we discussed earlier, is, is avoiding tax increases and, if possible, you know, rolling taxes back for folks. Because the ARPA funds are, are, are their money, too. Right. I, I don't think dead zones, sim simply because they're in Piedmont District or Stonewall District or Jackson District or that supervisor's um, only. I mean, only that supervisor's concerned because we, we all live here and people take the 231 corridor to, to get to Charlottesville or Madison uh, instead of, you know, going down 229 to 29 or whatever, or 522 to 29. So uh, it, it impacts everybody that lives here when, when they get out and they have trouble and the phones aren't operable. And then if they get out to... Uh to go on a hike and the trailhead's closed, or you have to have a ticket. They can't buy a ticket. They get redirected. It's tr it's a problem for everybody. Yeah, it's just yeah, it, it affects everybody. Like say the spillover went back over to from Old Rag went to uh, Piedmont and Hampton District. For sure, Mr. Frazier, you want to go next? Well, I, I just kind of blundered into that, but I mean, I, I mentioned a few things that I think are the board's priorities: this uh, building concerns and the uh, the broadband issues. Budget concerns are annual. You said budget. I thought you said building. No, uh, that's a third thing. Budget concerns are that's an annual concern, but we've we we've, we've really got to tighten up on these buildings and, and start making progress on them. All right. So uh, I just echo most of everything that Ms. Smith said and then the things that I've outlined. I think those are priorities. I, I don't, this other thing I think is a, just a diversion, it's a distraction, it's kind of like a bike trail. Thank you. Mr. Carney? Um, and I'd like to agree with Ms. Smith, Mr. Frazier, that um, I think uh, that moving forward, supporting our fire and rescue is critical right now. And I think that focusing on that and putting as much energy and time and goodwill that we can towards that is a big goal for me. Uh, the second would be the buildings. After we had that joint meeting with the building committee, uh, it was incredibly informational. And um, I see there's a real need to make some headway there. Um, and third, I'll keep it to three, would be... Um, I should say tightening up our agritourism ordinance so that the business opportunities that we do have here in this county, uh, we can take advantage of, but that fit with our community. And Rappahannock is not like any other place. So what's going to work here probably doesn't work elsewhere. And like Ms. Smith said earlier, uh, the spirit of the law was to help people do agriculture and stay on their property. And uh, what people all too often do is just sort of have a bar um, without maybe growing anything. And so what we need to do is just take a really good look at that um, so that we can... Here. So um, there, there's one one property I think that and one use of that property that's been problematic for um, a number of residents in the voting district I represent, and I've tried to take it apart to within the context of state code regarding 
farm wineries and agritourism businesses, and I took it apart in a couple of ways. One, as Ms. Barsky knows, was uh, by way of a consultation with VDOT, and then as a follow-up consultation with VDOT. And another, another way I, I looked at it and, and tried to make some progress was by way of uh, Virginia ABC. Um, on the latter point, what I learned in talking with Virginia ABC is that a, a, a person can hold a Class A farm winery license without basically any fermentation equipment. Um, I'll just be blunt, it's, the standard is really a joke, and the ABC agent admitted as much to me. Um, so, I mean, I, I was concerned that um, <clears throat> the property that has, has been sort of expanding its operations with all kinds of different activities loosely tied to a farm winery and agritourism, they weren't doing right by their neighbors and maybe didn't even qualify as a farm winery, but ABC straightened me out on that. So under, under the, the current definition of a Class A farm, farm winery, they check all the boxes and they meet all the requirements. So there's that. Then there's the question of Clark Lane. And on Clark Lane, March 2020, we uh, denied a special exception permit for a country and because um, and I believe we voted 5 nothing unanimously because we made the judgment as the local governing body that any level of commercial traffic on Clark Lane was appropriate. And we've talked about this many times since, and now that, now that same structure is being operated as a tasting room, and I've learned from the APC agent that um, the property owner or lessee will soon be applying to expand their um, farm brewery over to that facility as well. And that just flies in the face of the basic tenets of our decision back then on the country, and which is that tiny lane, which is 12 feet wide, adjacent to the farmer's co-op, by any measure cannot meet uh, VDOT road standards for a, an agritourism business. So to that end, um, <clears throat> we discussed at length with VDOT one, whether they agreed it did not meet their standard, they agreed it did not. And then two, what would be required for it to meet their standard. And what we what we got from VDOT in the end was basically a letter saying that in their judgment, the traffic through that entrance is not um, substantial enough to have them require the property owner to modify that entrance. And so I'm, uh, again, I've gone at it multiple ways. I, in my view, uh, I don't. I don't believe that that property has any bona fide agricultural activity. Um, I don't think disc golf is a customary use of a winery, even if you were growing grapes, and they're not. Um, so uh, I am frustrated, and I'm hopeful that through our work with the Berkeley Group and through a real close review of state code and our zoning ordinance, we can reach some kind of um, position and our ability to um, enforce our zoning ordinance to protect our citizens against what I believe is a misuse of um, of this agritourism designation to basically do whatever we want. That's not in the spirit of law, and it's not right for our citizens. And um, I'm happy to say all of that because I know that um, my constituents on Clark Lane have um, suffered a lot. And I just want to make sure that everyone's clear that I know they're suffering a lot, and we've been trying, as I've said, multiple angles to try to reach a, a, a point where the county can engage in some kind of enforcement. And to date, we've been unsuccessful, and VDOT, to some extent, has stood in our way, and certainly ABC has stood in our way, despite our best efforts to compel them to do the right thing. So I just, I just want to put that out there um, on the record. Thank you. Thank you. May I comment, please? Um, <coughs> if the board does not mind, I'm going to let him. I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm fine with that. Okay. Yes, sir. My name is Jock Nash, Hampton County. I want to thank uh, Supervisor Whitson for his comments. 
it is, does put a lot of it in context. I've only lived here seven years, but the saga of Clark Lane goes on for almost 20. Tens of thousands of dollars of litigation expenses for three different illegal, I repeat, illegal B&Bs on that property. When it was so outrageous with the current owner, Carl Hendrickson, that the VZA revoked their B&B permit. And they gave them six months to tell all the weddings they can't come and to do whatever they had to do. And still, they violated <clears throat> the rules. And they had to have a second revocation. And their lawyers turned right around and said, well, we're not going to deal with the BZA anymore. We're going to deal with the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors. That was probably a big mistake. It shows you how not, they don't have any situational awareness. The Planning Commission turned down their country in unanimously. The Board of Supervisors turned down their, their application unanimously. A good part because of the entrance. I know we got a 12-foot tar and chip lane. Sometimes it's only six feet wide. That's not the issue. The issue is, and none of you, not one of you in this room except for Yoko, has had to turn off of the highway to go up Clark Lane when all of a sudden someone's coming down Clark Lane or someone's coming out the exit of the co-op. No one has died yet, but past performance is not future. And you'll have blood on your hands. It is really sometimes very, very scary. It was that safety element that played a big role in the supervisors and the planning commission. And I would like our government, our county government, to put pressure on VDOT. Because if they're going to waive this rule, they, they've told us that they're not going to do it, but they don't give us any proof of what the traffic is. I would like them to come up and show us. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. So I do know I've reached out to Vaco to see if they had somebody that specializes in this, um, and I have not heard back yet. Do you know of anyone in particular agricultural law in Virginia? No, I, I don't. I would just this these sorts of things get resolved through litigation and precedent-setting litigation. Um, and that's how these wide-ranging allowances get boxed in little <clears throat> by little until the General Assembly sees the box and decides whether they like it or not, and they change the code to allow weddings or don't allow weddings or this or that uh, as the different sessions. I haven't seen any bills this year about this, but there have been. Um, what this board might consider and through your legal apparatus, do you want to be the body that sets legal precedent or do you want to follow legal precedent set by somebody else? The, the challenge I think for us as a county which is unique is that we've so long uh, <coughs> been devoted to agriculture and set aside a special place in the county for agriculture and the long arm of Richmond comes in and bastardizes all that by allowing all these uses with any control on our part. That's the heart of the problem. All the protections that we sought to gain by having land and agriculture is undermined by these. And, and some of them are very legitimate operations <clears throat> and are growing things and trying to be good neighbors and doing what they should do. But there are some of them that are actively flouting um, and, and using it in ways that, for which I don't believe this uh, part of the code was truly intended. And uh, what, what do, what's usual and customary? We are suddenly at the mercy of the most permissive zoning in the state because something that they do might become usual and customary, um, whereas we've always prided ourselves on strict zoning. 
um, because of its overreach in the, in the, in the code of the state of Virginia. All, all one has to do is look at Oasis over in Falk Ear. So I had heard that Albemarle had had some successes. Um, is that part of what you think the Berkeley group will bring to well, the... Uh, well, one would <clears throat> hope that they'll bring a holistic view based on their knowledge across the state. And, um, they're not providing legal advice. They're providing zoning information. And, um, should the board want to expand your legal advice, uh, I would consult with Mr. Goff and see if he recommends doing something different than what you're doing now. But at least you should understand what they, Berkeley Group believes may be best practices across the state that they've seen applied. And let them know that, as Mr. Whitson noted earlier, they understand that we are not like some of our neighbors where we want to be the cabin capital of Virginia. Uh, we want maybe the opposite of that. So some counties might want to do everything they can <clears> to <throat> cause some of these things to happen as much as possible, and others might want to do it in a take the opposite approach and allow them to happen only with reasonable and cautious conditions. Who's the point of contact at the Berkeley Group? Um, there are several, but uh, Ms. Davis, Ms. Ms. Cobb at this point. Any other? Madam Chair, I was, Yes, sir. Madam Chair, this is Keir Winston. Um, I, I really appreciated you allowing Mr. Nash to speak. He was very, very articulate and, and passionate for a reason. And I, I just wanted to, one anecdote I wanted to share, which goes to the point you made. I think it was about six weeks ago, my daughter and I were, we were up on Clark Lane, um, you know, dodging potholes and all that. And we came out at the co-op entrance and uh, <laughs> Miss Smith's constituent, Miss Butler, pulled into Clark Lane and as I'm trying to pull out into 211. And Mr. Nash already made the point, but I experienced it. And Miss Butler basically had to back into the co-op parking lot almost parallel to 211 and not that far out of the travel lanes going westbound. And um, that was just me on a, a random day taking a look. And um, I can tell you that, that <clears throat> any amount of traffic other than basic residential traffic through that um, entrance cannot pass uh, the VDOT red face pass. I mean, we, they cannot look us in the eye and tell us that that entrance is acceptable for anything even one small step above residential traffic. So um, I just want to I want to thank Ms. Barsky and Mr. Nash for coming back yet again. And I, I know the frustration I'm frustrated too. And um, I can tell you, I've been trying everything. So thank you. Thank you. I do believe this um, is an issue that we're all concerned about, and uh, the conversation will continue. I, I look forward to getting the Berkeley group engaged as quickly as possible. On the, does uh, a letter from the board to VDOT, would that be in order? Just to point out the history of the lane and, and that we've revoked a permit for... Uh, Mr. Whitson and I were very clear with them. I wrote um, a very clear letter to VDOT outlining their legal authority to do that, to, to do this, to look at the entrance and require it to be upgraded. And the lack of authority that the county has with matters such as agritourism. And uh, they reviewed it and basically stated that they didn't believe the current situation merited them forcing the entrance to be upgraded. Um, we can try to go up the ladder as you did on other issues. I, I wouldn't suggest you're going to get any different answer. Um, so perhaps the best thing to do is to keep working on the ordinances. Um, <clears throat> the legal route would be some sort of violation notice that then would be appealable to the BZA and appealable to the courts and could set some sort of precedence or be brushed away by the courts by us being overzealous enforcers of the law. It's a hard track to commit to when your legal uh, your legal uh, counsel isn't present. I think we need to do both. Have a 
a two-pronged uh, effort on this. I think we need to go to Mark Nesbitt and tell him that we'd like to have it, re you know, further review and uh, and talk about the legal action as well later on. The one we can make a decision tonight. The other we should wait. Mr. Whitson, what are your thoughts with what the Planning Commission and Berkeley Group are doing together? I'm wondering if having more information would allow us to have a better conversation or if having a conversation first would allow you to give the Berkeley Group more information. I think we can, um, you mean Board of Supervisors sort of collecting all the pieces and, and feeding that to the Berkeley Group? Is that what you mean? Um, I'm trying to figure out what is going to be the most beneficial use and timely one because um, it has been going on for 20 years. Yeah, I think I think here's here, here's what we need. Um, we need we need Mr. Goff to give us some guidance on sort of <clears throat> the risk reward, um, the risk the risks and rewards of of pursuing violation notices, for example, I think that's an important key point. I mean, I've asked, I've asked multiple times how a person could have a golf course without a permit. It's in the zoning ordinance. Um, that's one thing. Um, but I think, I think Mr. Curry articulate, articulated it pretty well. I mean, there is no <laughs> it, this this customary and usual use of and agriculture or related to agriculture to this. I mean, there's no precedent out there on an attorney, and it's clear to me that if we um, go, on, go out on a limb, we're going to need our attorney to advise us on the potential, real potential for litigation and the risk scenarios. So, I mean, I think we need to talk with Mr. Goffin's board and kind of map out very clearly where, if anywhere, we have a path forward. And then if the only path forward is zoning violation notices that might or might not lead to further litigation, then we have to do a cost-benefit analysis to determine if we want to put ourselves and taxpayers in that position. Um, as far as the Berkeley group goes, um, I think that this discussion tonight reminds me that this is a priority area. So I think from a planning commission standpoint, once we get through the initial Diagnostic work that I described earlier. I think we need to we need to pivot to a review of what <clears throat> what state code says about farm wineries, agritourism businesses, and where our zoning ordinance can be strengthened. And maybe all tomorrow is one model. Um, as far as our board goes, I see no reason why we wouldn't elevate this to VDOT. We got to try up, elevate this within VDOT. Like that's one <coughs> area um, to pursue. Um, I think we should probably uh, talk with Delegate Weber, <coughs> Senator Hosenchain, and any other folks that um, are friends in Richmond and just explain to them the predicament we and our citizens find ourselves in vis-a-vis -vis the, the agritourism and farm wiring provisions of state code. So that's another area. And so those, I think those two areas are where our board can focus in the near term going up the flagpole within VDOT and then um, taking advantage of our relationships in Richmond um, to make sure everyone knows how difficult this is for a locality. I mean, we're, we're, we basically have our hands tied and we can't get help from ABC or from VDOT, so where else do we go? Um, we got to try and frankly, we should probably contact ABC as well. Um, so that would be three areas and I'd be happy to do some of the writing for all of that, but I think we got it. We should just keep elevating and then work through our zoning ordinance with the Berkeley group, figure out if we can strengthen our zoning ordinance to protect ourselves a little bit, and then um, talk with Mr. Goff to see if we have any legal options. Okay, so if I am hearing him correctly and if I'll agree, we can uh, get Mr. Whitson to help with uh, writing up something for the VDOT, ABC, and um, Delegate Weber, uh, Senator Obenshain, and we'll start there. And, and I would just, uh, just to make it, uh, I'll uh, put 
that iteration in the, in the form of a motion. And we go ahead and draft letters uh, to State Senator Robin Shane, uh, Delegate Wabert, uh, the Virginia Department of ABC, and the Virginia Department of Transportation, um, elevating in particular the situation on Clark Lane, but in general, um, the Commonwealth's approach to farm wineries, farm distilleries, and farm breweries, um, and the effects that will have on our on our county um, with the sort of uh, broad approach that Richmond has taken. Okay. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, let's see, the addendum town boundary line change request. This was information um, letter received from Mayor Catlin. Just for the record, the um, as board is aware the town um, sent the board a letter uh, back in November board of supervisors reviewed that letter uh, provided a comment back to the town in January and the town just yesterday uh, sent a letter back which is attached to board docs all three letters are attached to board docs for public's consumption uh, have the board discussed this earlier you've just received this you haven't digested it it's my recommendation to have the item on the agenda so all these documents could be shared with the public and be captured on this meeting agenda for the future. And, uh, I didn't really consider that you might do anything else unless you want to do something else. Um, hey, Madam Chair, this is Keir Winston. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, this afternoon, several members of the public spoke during the public comment period about what they read in the paper. Um, some one person even said that in our our suggestion that, you know, there could be some exchange of, of something with the town um, for the boundary line adjustment that that amounted to a form of extortion. I just wanted to provide some context back. Last January, January 2021, um, the property owner and his attorney came to the Board of Supervisors. The property owner's attorney, Mr. Foote, stood in front of the Board of Supervisors and actually articulated a number of possible offers that the tech that they had already discussed with the town in the context of a contemplated boundary line adjustment. Then in, I think, August of last year, um, Mr. Foote, the property owner's attorney, sent a draft boundary line adjustment agreement to our board. And in that draft agreement, there were specific offers of um, removal of deed restrictions on properties in the town and other things. So I don't, I, I just want the public to understand that when I or anyone else suggests that maybe there would be something to exchange as part of this agreement, that didn't come out of, any, of, out of nowhere. That, that whole idea, that, that concept of exchange for the boundary line adjustment began with the property owner and his attorney coming before the board of supervisors and in a draft boundary line adjustment agreement that they later disseminated to us um, in the middle part of the last year. So at least in my case, when I raise the question of what the town might be willing to provide in exchange is, is strictly within the context of what the property owner is attorney, presumably in consultation with the town, had already discussed with us both verbally and in writing. So I just want to make that clear on the record that um, this wasn't us extorting anyone. This was us following up basically on some initial informal offers made to us when the idea was first brought before our board. Thank you. Thank you. And if I'm reading this correctly, the property owner hasn't, um, it doesn't look like this letter provides anything from them specifically. So um, my hope is that we'll be receiving something from them as well. And that's as far as I think we need to go unless there's more from other board members. Well, by looking at this letter, again, Mr. 
uh, you know, Mr. Mayor Caitlin is uh, he's conflating misinformation with uh, maybe just a general lack of knowledge on somebody's part of what's actually going down. Just your second paragraph. We want we want to reaffirm that the request for a boundary line adjustment BLA for the property at the corner of Warren Avenue and Route 2211-522 came from the property owner, not the town. Like you, we are seeking to address that request by starting the process of review. They have went far beyond that process on their part. They're asking us to, to agree to this boundary adjustment for the property owner, they say. And I think a very, very good question was brought up on one of the uh, social media sites recently. If this is the if this is the um, precedent that they set by asking for a boundary adjustment to bring a property into the town because it's either a border property or it straddles the line, what are they going to do the next time when somebody with a much larger parcel wants to, to come into the town so that they can develop it at a, at a higher density than they're allowed to under the county ordinance? So this really sets a very bad precedent for the, the, the public language that they keep sending out as if you know, it bypasses their planning process, initiated by the property owner. We're trying to work with the property owner to, to fulfill this request. That's not good zoning. That's not planning. That's, I don't know what you call that, besides uh, just not good. And I could spend a lot of time on that and, and find some legal words that would come to mind, but this is just doesn't make any sense. And then, that's just the second paragraph. You can read on from there. And, you know, he's, he, he's, uh, I guess it's the first bullet point under the, with the fourth paragraph. Uh, by encouraging the prudent development of this small piece of land, the county could see an increase of fifteen to 20000 annual property tax revenue from land improvements. Whatever they build there, the county would, would see that same revenue stream. So, the, I mean, this is something that the county already has. This is not something that they would be able to do. It doesn't, it's just, you know, for whatever reason, the paper didn't quote me on it, but we've got a lot of people involved in this process that don't know what they're doing. And that's what I said. And I wish it had been said two or three weeks ago, but the paper's only got so much room that they can write in. I didn't send it to the young lady over here. But... Uh, that's, that's the whole problem. We're dealing with, with you know, like Mr. Whitson said, that, that uh, offer of exchange was initiated by the property owner's attorney right here in this room and in a, in a letter to the board both. You can get this and maybe get that. And now we're told that simply by asking for that and maybe uh, uh, some definitions on a little bit more or whatever, the extortion? Excuse me? It's not extortion. It's called planning and zoning. Again, the question I, I'd like to, the, the uh, town council and the mayor to answer is, what happens the next time you have a boundary property or overlapping property that wants to, to rezone? It's a bad precedent. All right. And I don't think that this letter gave, gives me the clarity on... Um, the waste extending wastewater services outside of the town, which is one of the major sticking points. I, I don't feel like that's really cleared up as we requested it. They're already extending it past the boundaries. They're extending it to this courthouse complex. This is county property, not town. They're already doing that. Well, that's a good point. I don't I don't know if they noticed that. <laughs> so um, does anybody have any suggestions on um, what we'd like to do um, to me, the property owner and the attorney aren't in this conversation. I'm trying to figure out if it would make sense to have invite them to a. I don't see any point in us spending much time on this when they're ready to do something. They can, they can come forward. I think we've got a lot, of, a lot of stuff on our plate. Yeah. And I think this really should be, this is a really a distraction right now for us. We've got uh, all these buildings to work on. We've got. The broadband issue that the broadband authority is working on, and the board of supervisors as well. Please hold. All right. Um, <clears throat> I am reconvening, reconvening the um, 
Board of Supervisors meeting that uh, for Monday, February 7th. And I think we need to do the certification of the closed meeting. Yes. Do each of you certify that to the best of your knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from the open meeting requirements of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered by the Board of Supervisors in closed meeting. And just need to... Roll call? Yes. All right. Mr. Frazier? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mr. Carney? Aye. Mr. Whitson? Aye. And I also. Madam Chair? Yes, sir. Would it be... Uh, uh, convenient at this time to suggest a uh, amendment to the agenda so that we can discuss uh, the board uh, taking action on some of the items that we may have discussed earlier. Is that in the form of a motion? We've got a motion um, to discuss what came out of the meeting. Well, I would. Um I would recommend that you work through your public hearings and right, but we put that just on to the amend, end. put it yeah, down at the end. The very last item. It's, a, it's an addendum item. <clears throat> so we'll make it uh, Q five, I guess. Does that work for you? Yes. Do we have a name for this agenda item? Um, you would have something like that, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Strategic planning, fire and rescue. How's that? Sounds good. I have a motion um, for an addendum that's going to Q5 on the agenda. Do I have a second? I'll second that. I'll second. <clears throat> All right, I think I heard Mr. Carney first, so we're going to go with Mr. Fraser, Mr. Carney. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fraser. All right. Uh, at this point, we'll go into the public hearing. Yes, if I could just give a quick introduction and then you can hear from the public. Uh, information is provided with the meeting packet regarding uh, this public hearing. It's a modification of Chapter 15 voting districts. Uh, this ordinance amendment is required to um, reconcile the populations resulting from the 2020 census. Um, the redistricting process seeks to balance out the population in each of your five districts. Uh, the intent is to be within plus or minus 5% of the average for each district. After looking at those um, values, the board at a previous meeting authorized a public hearing to consider modifying your voting districts by shifting one small area located currently in the Wakefield District to either the Jackson District or the Hampton District. Two different versions of an ordinance that would pre cause that to happen are attached to the packet and have been advertised and available uh, for inspection in my office. Those are option A, uh, which would send those individuals to the Jackson District, and B, which would uh, send them over to the Hampton District. Uh, these documents are all provided here and have been available for inspection, as I noted, and it was advertised in the newspaper as required when you mod amend an ordinance pursuant to Code of Virginia, Section 15.2.14.27. Um, we'll, we'll add that each of the ordinances has an appendix as referenced within the ordinance that includes the actual descriptions of the, um, of the different voting districts as well as a GIS-based map. And I have printed those out for you just so you have a better view. With all that said, you can open the floor to the public. Okay. Um, so I'm opening this public hearing with regards to the districts. If anyone wants to speak, please raise your hand and uh, we'll recognize you and let you uh, give us your name <clears throat> and your district. Seeing no one in the courtroom and nobody on iPad other than Mr. Whitson. Sorry, Mr. Whitson. You are somebody. Um, <clears throat> I guess I will close the public hearing portion and open it up to the board. Um, Madam Chair, this is Kira Whitson. Um, I know we, we've gotten a very good explanation from Patrick Monty from the, um, the Regional Commission and um, I think you presented to us 
some good options in the two that were advertised. I think were best available among those presented. I think they're most, they're least disruptive, and I think um, provide our voters with minimal change in the sense that you won't see a lot of citizens or as many citizens under the other scenarios receiving notices that they'll be um, voting somewhere else other than when they, where they've been voting in recent years. And um, so I, I, I think they're both very good options. Um, I also think that the both of them, option A and B, just from a map standpoint, are easy to implement. And I would note, I think we all received uh, the same message from the registrar voters that she uh, she reviewed both options and um, has a preference for option A. And so just to move this along, I will go ahead and put forward a motion to adopt uh, ordinance option A to amend chapter 15 of the county code as presented. Thank you. Thank you. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second that motion. We have a motion and a second uh, <coughs> discussion. And just to be clear, this is the version that <coughs> shifts those uh, folks that were in the southern end of Wakefield into Jackson. I mean, I, I think I've said before, I understand how folks would filter into Jackson District. I think growth is much more likely in Jackson District. Additional homes being built and voters filtering in, it's it's much more likely to happen in Jackson District than in Hampton District. And I, I, I think if we do it with uh, the option uh, to send this portion over to Jackson District, we're going to be revisiting it sooner rather than later. But, you know, you if my peers feel differently, then that's... So Jackson's been reduced in size uh, twice in the last two cycles. <clears throat> And uh, it's been reduced several times over the years. Yeah. Chris Parrish used to live in Jackson District. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I mean, I, that's just my that's just my point of view. If, if people don't agree with me, that's fine. I just if you ask me where growth is coming from, Hampton is kind of surrounded by other districts on all sides in the park. Um, Jackson's got Culpeper and Falk here coming. Um, I just think that it's much more likely we're going to see a, an uptick in Jackson District before we do Hampton. If you think of this as the propagation over time, you will do this again in 10 years <coughs> in the next decennial census. Um, the, it's likely that the Piedmont District will have to continue getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's already the biggest, Gary. <laughs> because uh, it, the other areas are likely to pick up population faster than the Piedmont district. And oh, so massive. as more and more people move into Chester Gap, Wakefield gets smaller. As more and more people move into the Amosville area proper, Jackson has to get smaller and the others kind of have to fill out. So Hampton is a good donor for the future, can be shifted to any other district. Uh, that said, if you look at the map, you can see that from a general compactness, um, the map looks a little less jagged, but it's not very complex in either manner. Hmm. And for me, at Wakefield District, we used to um, have Mr. Um, oh, darn it, Mr. Lee was our supervisor, and then we went to Mr. Welsh. And for some reason, I think we went back again or something. We ended up with Mr. Welsh. Um, but I know we voted in Little Washington there for a while, and it was just so strange to drive <coughs> past the Flint Hill Fire Department and vote in Washington. Um, so it comes and goes, ebbs and flows. But I, I, I agree that A seems to be, um, from a map standpoint, um, the better of the two. Um, um, well, I, I do see what Ms. Smith is saying, and that does make some seemingly some some sense. Miss um, McKiernan's uh, email to us all suggesting that they favor option A, 
would make me tend toward that as the registrar is going to bear the brunt of the work. And, uh, but she did say that option B would be comparable. Um, um, statistically, if anybody cares about that, um, option B renders a better statistical answer in that the um, average absolute deviation is 2.74% away from that mean, whereas option A is 3.58%. Mm. Means you're just, right. in whole, you're closer to the 1475 people per district. But again, everything is within the tolerance. <coughs> Either is perfectly acceptable. Any further discussion? All right. Um, all those in favor of roll call. Roll call. Roll call. Roll call. Option A. Uh, Mr. Frazier? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mr. Carney? Aye. Mr. Whitson? Aye. And I also. Thank you and Patrick for all the effort. All right, uh, public hearing <coughs> chapter 151 taxation ordinance amendment. I assume everybody else is here to talk about this one. Or it's a slow movie night. The, um, I was before you some months ago asking the board to consider amending this ordinance to uh, correct some language there relative to uh, the dates when the Board of Equalization would, would meet and uh, the Board adopted an ordinance that allowed those dates to slide in time. However, it still fixed the overall time period that the Board of Equalization meets uh, to a relatively f few number pinned to the end of the assessor's hearings. Uh, since that time, um, Commissioner Revenue and I have identified Code of Virginia Section 58.13331 and that states that for people who are interested in having a Board of Equalization hearing, they are to be provided with their property record information 45 days before their hearing. Uh, that Code of Virginia section came about right while the last cycle for the county was happening. Might have been um, considered, might not have. Uh, but at any rate, the current language before you for an amendment to this ordinance would build in the necessary time to allow that 45 days to take place um, and uh, meet the Code of Virginia section. Uh, so with that said, this ordinance has been available for inspection in my office, office and it was advertised in the newspaper twice as required by Code of Virginia 15.2.14.27. And with all of that said, unless there are any questions, it would be appropriate to seek input from the public. Okay. All right. So anyone wishing to speak uh, during this public hearing same rules apply, please let us know. And then uh, when you come up, let us know your name and your district. All right, we do have one person, I think on Zoom, listed as iPhone. If you are interested in uh, commenting, please raise your Zoom hand. All right, seeing no hands, I will close the public hearing and open the discussion to the board. <coughs> Madam Chair, I, I think this is straightforward and I appreciate Mr. Curry and Ms. Graham finding a way to resolve this to ensure protection for our citizens, which I think is the bottom line here. So to move this along, I will put forward a motion to adopt the ordinance as presented, which amends chapter 151 of the Code of Red Bank County. Thank you. Do I have a second? I'll second that. All right, thank you. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Roll, uh, roll call. Aye. Oh, dang, on. Roll, roll call. Mr. Frazier. Aye. Ms. Smith. Aye. Mr. Carney. Aye. Mr. Whitson. Aye. And I also. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, moving into public comment. 
Anyone wishing to um, speak to us this evening? Same rules? Yes, ma'am. Um, is Mr. Golf going to be here? I'm sorry? Mr. Golf? Not, I don't see him. No. It doesn't he appear. He will be giving the, um, his interpretation on the, uh, the agriculture, uh, well, right? What was that? Right? Agritourism? No, no. The agriculture by right review, I think, is what right, you mean. Agriculture right, right by... Oh, this one doesn't. P2. P2. P, oh, I'm sorry, 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 sorry. P2, yeah, agriculture by right. This, is this supposed to be uh, done by Mr. Yeah, uh, if I could interject it, the uh, agenda says that the county attorney will be providing yeah. that, that's an update what on his work. Said. So. That, that's what I basically, I, I, I like to address this to Mr. Goff. Yeah. So well, what what should I do? What would you like me to do? I would suggest if you have comments for the Board of Supervisors, which is the purpose of public comment, that yes. you provide those comments. Okay. Yeah. But it's I like to include uh, Mr. Coffin. I think we're at the same problem that we have in, in numerous other public hearings. The public has a problem trying to comment on something when they don't have the desired information. And I I see Ms. Orsky's uh I see, I see the problem that she's got here. She came uh, going by what the agenda says that the county attorney will provide an update on his work, and he's not here to do that. Well, I can't, we can't speak to whether he will be here in 10 or 15 minutes. Um, or not. He has uh, family issues he's tending to right now, and hopefully we'll be here. And if he's not, then he can receive the recording of your comments or written uh, representation of what they were, or you can hand okay. them something. Or... Okay, okay. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Yoko Barsky, live in Hampton District. Tonight, hopefully, we'll hear from county attorney about the interpretation of the Virginia Code regulating the agriculture by right. The pertinent sections of the code are listed on the board docs However, they do not include any regulations or requirements of the VDOT regarding the access roads to these agriculture, ag uh, agritourism establishments. This is very important, especially when it comes to agritourism issue in a place like Rappahannock, where so many agricultural lands are accessed via private roads or easements. VDOC does establish requirements for access to agritourism as an entrance requirements from their highways and the state controlled roads. Uh, because these activities bring in lots of people. I, do, I would like to request Mr. Goff and uh, supervisors, of course, to include his interpretation and your interpretation on this issue of VDOT requirements of the access roads to this agritourism and other agricultural commercial operations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any public comment? Anybody wishes? Yes, sir. John Capioli from the Hampton District. Um, I heard earlier, after I made an earlier comment, um, about the, uh, the fiber optic contract that's um, going to be finalized soon, hopefully, and about there being a connection somehow in a member's mind with fiber optic and telephone lines and cell phone lines about how um, nobody was allowed from the Board of Supervisors to 
negotiate with <coughs> anybody else because they were locked in. It seems to me that obviously there's um, a disconnect someplace in the understanding that the fiber optics have nothing to do with landlines. The companies don't even offer, uh, the fiber optic company doesn't even offer it. And the request was made that Rappahannock not negotiate with another fiber optic company. There's nothing in there whatsoever about existing landlines and getting them fixed or cell phones or cell phone towers because they're apples and oranges. They're totally different. Um, is there a way uh, to clarify for the board that the two subjects have nothing to do with one another? Because apparently a lot of the public is following this. Thank you. Anybody else? <coughs> Anyone on Zoom land wishing to speak during public comment? All right. Seeing none, I'll close the public comment period. And we'll go into old business uh, water resources protection and monitoring. I can um, let everybody know that Vincent Day and Bradley White, White from what's his department? DEQ. Virginia DEQ Groundwater Characterization Program. Um, and Mr. Curry and I had a phone call. Um, they are more than willing to come and speak uh, to the board. Their, um, I think, general consensus was they don't feel like we were. I, we talked a lot about Sperryville because that seems to be the, the target. Um, they're not as concerned as, as we are, um, but there seems to be one, we talked about the well monitoring and then uh, also talked about maybe adding another stream or a stream to the monitoring process. Um, they basically told us that Loudon had did, done something like that and Albemarle had done something like that and they both gathered a lot of data and then didn't do anything with it and then stopped. Um, but just wanted to make sure everybody knows we had that conversation and they're willing to come speak to the board. Um, they can do a presentation or um, whatever we'd like if that topic is still. I think that would be very useful. I mean, we've, we've sort of batted this around for a few months now. So I think um, I think hearing from some experts on it would be, would be really refreshing. And um, I think we had talked about the possibility of an intern, too, at the last meeting. And I was wondering if anything had materialized on that. And we did discuss with Mr. Day and Mr. White about the value of that work being done. Um, and uh, they questioned whether there would be value. Uh, but short answer, we have not inked any deals with any interns. Okay. What exactly is their organization? Uh, he, Brad White is with DEQ, responsible <clears throat> for groundwater resources in this region, and Mr. Day is a local hydrogeologist or geologist. Right, I think he did the uh, work for the golf course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and they both know the county extremely well. That's why I think um, if the board agrees, there, it, it will be an interesting presentation as long as we can kind of put borders around what we're truly looking for, because I think they could talk water um, and soil for hours. Yeah. It might be a good idea. I mean, earlier when you were talking about the beavers, oh, no, Mr. Whiston was talking about the beavers, I'm sorry. I was wondering, you know, if we could just put those beavers to work on those ash trees. <laughs> Targeted. Tree. Yes. Yeah. They don't seem to want to work with people. <laughs> um, so if the board yeah. um, agrees, we'll, I'll ask them to come present um, as soon as they can. Sure. Yeah. And if you have specific areas of interest, um, because I know we really need to make sure we control their amount of time, um, other than wells and streams in Rappahannock County, if there's something in particular, let me know and I'll make sure they are prepared. I would be really curious to know what other localities have done in terms of monitoring or what sort of um, measurements we can take as a locality. How can we implement a system that would allow us to to monitor in an effective way um, if there's a model for that yeah, and rather than just I mean I could I could listen to a broad discussion about water and soil for a long time yeah. 
And I think a lot of people could, but at the end of the day, we want to come out with a fruitful end product um, that matches up, you know, our expectations. So um, I would I would just say, uh, I'd love a general discussion, but we really need to know what the takeaway is, uh, what we can hope to implement as a result of that discussion. Would you be comfortable with the focus being more in Sperryville? There's so much... There's so many people that I know personally that just have issues in and around Sperry. I, I think a general discussion is fine. I think this is a countywide issue. Um, I, I know when this was first brought before the board, a, a lot of heads bobbed up and down in this room in the course of the discussion. Um, that this is just something that uh, you might think it's fine, um, and then suddenly everybody's wells drying up and you're in trouble. What the water tables changed, I think, if uh, countywide, but. It may be more predominant out your way. Uh, that Sperryville 231 522 corridor may be um, largely affected, whereas the rest of us are maybe marginally affected. But we have springs in Amosville that no longer produce. Mm. Why? I, I don't know. One of the questions, and this was kind of uh, hoping we can target, that I asked was um, you know, our comp plan, everything says <coughs> build in the villages. Well, if Everybody builds in the villages. Does all of a sudden your neighbor not have a well or whatever? So um, having them be able to speak to the comp plan slash zoning as we may need to look at what we're really saying to do if we're not sure that water is going to be there or not. Again, I can tell you they didn't seem to feel that there was a sense of urgency, um, but I'd much rather they spoke and we all came to that conclusion or not. Mr. Whitson, anything from you on targeted topic for these guys? Uh, no, uh, I think we've already talked about well data um, and how we could use that to give us some foundation for analysis. Um, I think I think what they both could provide to us, going beyond well related data, is just what other types of data a locality like ours with a small staff could collect easily that would be useful for us to, you know, on an ongoing basis determine our water resources position over time. So, I mean, I think that can all come out of just uh, an open discussion with them. But I, I think it's a really good idea to bring some people who know our, our area and who know their, their field of expertise. So thanks a lot. It was definitely interesting. Yeah. All right, if there's nothing more on that one, we'll go into agriculture by right review. Uh, obviously, as stated, Mr. Goff is not with us right now. Um, uh, this uh, agenda item was, uh, I pulled this agenda item, I believe, from July 20, um, when it was uh, last before the board, and Mr. Goff provided some of his input at that time. Um, we understand that there are continue to be a lot of questions and concerns around the agritourism, various agritourism um, by right opportunities for landowners. I don't know what much I can help with the board uh, on this beyond what is provided here. I uh, did note that um, conversations with Mr. Whitson during the kickoff meeting with the Berkeley group and earlier uh, suggested that after they finish their diagnostic and their first step, there are a few things that um, would be on the short list for them to help us with uh, events and that whole continuum. This agritourism process uh, to help make sure our local ordinances are um, in sync with current state law and allow you to regulate these types of uses to the greatest extent that you are allowed to or and want to. Uh, so that is in the pipeline for our relationship with the Berkeley Group. I can try to answer questions if you have them, although I certainly can't get any, any legal analysis. Um, <clears throat> Madam Chair, Mr. Curry, if I could jump in. I I think Ms. Barsky is there in the room, if I'm not mistaken. Is she? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so um, I just wanted to provide some context.